Ladies and gentlemen, the November 26, 2013 meeting of the Santa Barbara City Council's Finance Committee will now come to order. Are there any members of the public wishing to speak on topics not on today's agenda? Seeing none, I will close public comment and let us move to the first item, Mr. Samario. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, we're here to talk about a proposed refunding or refinancing of the Waterfront Certificates of Participation. They're the uh, 2002 um, bonds that were sold or certificates that were sold. I want to just start by saying that I'm going to get into some fairly complicated discussions about how we're structuring this financing deal, but I would, if you can just keep in mind that ultimately what we're trying to do is just refinance the old debt with new debt or from new debt in order to take advantage of lower interest rates, just like you would if you were going to refinance your mortgage. You know, interest rates are now low, and so if you finance, you could take you know, lower your payments on a monthly basis. That's all we're really trying to accomplish here. Um, Unfortunately, we have state law and other provisions of our charter that, that require us or at least um, force us to kind of take a different approach or a, a creative financing, financing approach in order to accomplish the same goal. But if you can keep in mind that all we're doing is just trying to generate savings for the waterfront in this case, um, that will help, I think, in the discussion. So in terms of the bond financing team, there are um, uh, various players. Our city staff, of course, includes Sarah Connect, assistant city attorney, myself, Scott Reedman, who is the waterfront director, and Brian Bossy, the business manager for the waterfront. Our financial advisors are KNN. Um, the managing partner is David Brosley, who is here today. He's standing, sitting in front. So any questions that you might have of him, he's here to answer those. Um, his assistant, uh, Netco Nadiv, assistant vice president, uh, he does a lot of the number crunching. He's not here. And then our bond council is Ora Carrington Subcliff. We've used them in the past. Um, and the, the partner, Bill Bothwell, is the person who is our direct contract contact person. Uh, he will be at the council meeting on December 10th when we bring this to the full council. So as I mentioned, background, very low interest rate environment, historically low interest rates that we're seeing now, uh, which means that existing debt um, issues before this current environment, um, we just look at those on an ongoing basis for opportunities to refinance and take advantage of those lower interest rates. We recently finan refinanced the water fund debt. Um, we were here about six months ago to discuss that and brought it to council. Um, we, at the same time, uh, refunded the, the 2003 state revolving loan that they had along with the 2002 re water refunding COPs. That generated annual savings of about $180,000 for the, for the water fund. So pretty substantial amount of money that just by taking advantage of these lower interest rates. And we, we recognized this early on. We were with, to the Finance Committee a number of months ago. We identified that there may be other uh, opportunities, one of them being the waterfront COPs that, um, could, where we could save some money. So now that we're done with the water deal, we're here presenting an opportunity to refinance the waterfront COPs. So the financing structure. So just kind of a conceptual framework because this is what you would typically, this is what we're trying to accomplish. So um, the waterfront normally on a, on a, just on a conceptual basis is going to be issuing debt. And we're looking at about $14 million what's needed in order to refinance the bonds. So they will sell theoretically $14 million in revenue bonds to the investors. Investors will then pay to the waterfront fund the $14 million, which would be then used to pay um, to the escrow agent to refinance the old debt. So replacing an, um, one new debt with an old debt. That's the conceptual framework. We're just selling bonds to investors and using that money to re refinance the old bonds. And then we're going to have an ongoing requirement, of course, to repay those new debt. So every year, actually semi-annually, we'll pay interest, and annually we would pay principal. Um, the waterfront from its revenues, existing revenues, would pay the investors back on the bonds pursuant to the, the amortization schedule. So that's the concept. But we're going to, in order for us to accomplish this, we're going to, we introduce a, a new character, or not a new, but a, a, a third party, if you will. It's called the Santa Barbara Financing Authority. This is a legal entity, and we created this uh, strictly f to facilitate the issuance of these kinds of debts. Uh, we've done a number of them in the past. Um, and a, a, a joint powers authority, they're, you know, they're, they're typically created these types of entities to manage or administer common interests. We have examples here in the South Coast, the CCRB, which is the Kachuma Conservation Release Board. We also have CCWA, the Central Coast Water Authority. So the joint powers authorities are, are not a, a new uh, invention. They've been around for a while. Uh, we used the Santa Barbara Financing Authority in 2002 for the first time in the connection with the sale, the issuance of the 2002 water COPs. So it's not the first time we've used them. It is a joint powers authority that's per created pursuant to state law. 
And it was originally created between the city and the city's redevelopment agency, but as you know, the RDA no longer exists. And under those dissolution laws, successor agencies are allowed to assume the role of the former RDA. So this joint powers authority is really now between the city and the successor agency to the, to the RDA. Which is the city. Yes, and it's, it's sort of. So it's not really a joint powers <laughs> agreement. <laughs> True. Okay. It, legally and technically it is. So our, the, the state law and charter provisions, for enterprise fund revenue bonds, the state law does not require a voter approval, but our city charter does. It does require a majority vote whenever the enterprise funds or if the enterprise funds were to issue revenue bonds directly. However, by using the Santa Barbara Financing Authority, um, they will effectively issue the bonds. The, the enterprise fund, like in this case the waterfront fund, would not be issuing the bonds, but the authority would be. <laughs> And the, the bonds, however, are ultimately secured by payments to be made by the enterprise fund, in this case the waterfront fund, to the authority uh, pursuant to what's called an installment sale agreement, which we'll talk about. But the whole purpose of this is that, or the benefit of this is it does not require voter approval going under this financing structure. So if the, if the enterprise funds or the waterfront, for example, were to issue revenue bonds itself, it would require under our city charter voter approval. With, the, with this financing structure, it, it avoids that voter requirement. So conventionally, uh, what we would see is the, the, the waterfront fund, again, issuing revenue bonds to the investors and in return getting proceeds. But what we're going to be doing is introducing this, the Santa Barbara Financing Authority in the, sort of as a middleman, whereas they would be issuing the revenue bonds and getting the money, and that money would then be transferred over to the waterfront fund. It does create, in my mind at least, it creates the question or asks, begs the question, what is the basis or the consideration for the authority remitting $14 million to the waterfront fund? And the mechanism or the legal structure would be that the, the, the city waterfront fund would be, um, would be selling temporarily facilities, the facilities that were originally used or financed from the original bond issue, those facilities would be temporarily sold by the waterfront fund, um, by the waterfront to the authority. And that was, that's basically the consideration for getting $14 million from the authority. They're going to sell the project, the project we call it, to the authority, and in return the authority is going to provide $14 million to the city's waterfront fund that will then be used to pay off the old debt. <laughs> So once this kind of occurs, so the status of the Santa Barbara Authority, once the, the bonds have been issued, is that essentially it, or effectively it owns these, these facilities, the project, but it needs to also be making semi-annual interest payments and annual principal payments to the bondholders, but it has no source of revenue, so it's got to find a way to, to do that. And that's where the installment sale agreement comes into play. And Mr. again, Mario, one question sure. before you go on. So the... What, what are exactly the facilities that the project comprises? There were a number of them, and I know Scott Reeven is here can answer this, but there was a variety of facilities and improvements to the waterfront overall that were made back even in, when the, in the 80s when these bonds or the debt was originally issued. So I know if, if you want, okay. Scott, can come up and talk about Well, why don't about you that. finish yours, and then sure. we can talk about that. So what happens is that under the installment sale agreement that the project is essentially or instantaneously sold back by the authority to the waterfront and we're talking about somewhat fiction here again in order to accomplish this but the project is sold back by the authority to the waterfront and in return the waterfront agrees to pay the water the the authority over a period of time it's, so rather than pay the money back directly it's going to pay it over a period of time that corresponds to the debt service requirements on the bonds issued by the authority so it's a mechanism created to create a flow of funds that ultimately from the waterfront fund to the authority in order for them to be able to pay off the bonds. Remember the concept. The, the, essentially the waterfront is issuing debt and it's going to be using the proceeds of that to refund its old debt and it's going to re rely on its own revenues to pay on the new debt but it's just sort of using this middle, middle entity, the financing authority, in order to make that happen in order to just to, to avoid having, essentially to avoid having to vote over the people because that's costly, it's time consuming, and all we're trying to do here is accomplish savings of money. So we thought this is the best way to effectuate that. And this is not unusual, this is very typical. Mm -hmm. We've done this, we did, did this exact same thing with the waterfront, I'm sorry, the water uh, uh, refinancing six <laughs> months ago, same exact structure. It's just what we need to do in order to accomplish this financing. <clears throat> 
So the whole picture, the authority on the, on the left, number one, sells bonds, get for, gets $14 million from the investors. That money then is remitted to the waterfront fund in consideration for the, for the purchase of the, of the project. And then to the right, number three, that, million, that $14 million is used to pay the escrow agent who will take that money to refinance or refund, I'm sorry, to repay or pay off the 2002 waterfront COPs. And then the waterfront fund will be left with new debt, essentially. And so on an ongoing basis, the, the city's waterfront fund will be paying, making installment payments to the financing authority, who will use those monies to make semi-annual payments and annual payments of principal to the trustee, who will then remit those monies to the investor. And what's really, in reality, what's going to happen is the, the, the two entities will kind of become out, be taken out of the picture on an ongoing basis, basis because the city's waterfront fund will be making those payments directly to the investor. Effectively, we're just transferring money. We're bypassing all, the, all these entities and the flow of monies. It'll go directly to the investor. So again, it's, it's complicated, and it sort of seems unnecessary, but it is necessary for us to accomplish this financing. And the reason we go into this kind of detail is because when we're here at council, with council on December 10th, we're going to be presenting some documents that require approval by council. Um, such as an installment sale agreement and so forth. So um, it's important at least to understand this, the structure behind it and why we have such documents for approval. Any questions on this part of it, of the presentation? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Samario, I'm reading through here about um, potential risks. There's a couple of them here. Can you walk us through those? Or that's next? Yeah, we'll talk about that in, okay. in the second part of this, which is the proposal to do use a private placement versus the public offering. So, if, oh, unless okay. we have questions on this you. part, Thank we can you. get into that. I have a question. Um, I'm not sure which the, which charter provision it is that forces us to go to a vote of the people. So, excuse my ignorance on that. But is this something that we should change in the charter so that we wouldn't have to do this sort of runaround? Yeah, we could, but that would require voter approval. Right. Um, but we could, but um, obviously... I'm not saying that we do it for this one. Yeah. But just in the future, if it's... If there's such a clear distinction between a case like this where we're yeah. really just trying to save the city some money... Right. ...and something that's perhaps more risky... We could. Oh, we yeah. could. I mean, we, there's obviously a mechanism to, to get there anyway right now through this uh, financing right. structure, but, um, but we could. Okay. Thanks. So proposed private placement. So typically, oh, whenever um, an entity issues bonds, for example, uh, it's through what's called a public offering. And what that essentially means is that the, the bonds or the underlying debt instruments are, are available to any investor in, in, in the public. Any investor, all of you could invest, for, for example, in municipal bonds, municipal debt. But they, initially, they're sold to an investment bank, and then those, uh, the bank then sells those debt securities to private or institutional investors. Under a proposed private placement, the underlying debt instruments, in this case revenue bonds, are sold to one entity, a qualified institutional buyer versus the general public. So they're really purchased by one entity. The securities are retained by the bank in this case, and they're not sold to general investors. That's the difference, fundamental difference. So multiple investors available to anybody versus one investor buying all of the bonds. And the reasons for considering a private placement is that it, and this is significant, it does involve a lot of time on, on the part of uh, the staff to go through a typical public offering. There is, there are a lot of documents that need to be prepared, uh, what's called the disclosure information, which is the official statement, which is a fairly big document. It takes a lot of time to produce and compile all of that, and that's really mostly to staff time. Um, but that's what is required under a public offering. So with a private placement, we don't have that. With the, the time, amount of time of staff time is probably a third or maybe even less, a quarter of the time. Uh, there are reduction in transaction costs for, for our financial advisor, for our bond council and rating agencies. And other considerations, typically with a private placement, you do have a higher interest rate, so you're paying a little higher, a little more money for that. Um, the risks are, are in substance about the same, although they're slightly different. They're unique risks, but we don't see any substantive changes in our risk profile by going through a private placement. Um, the only risk we would have potentially is that we would have to pay $15,000 in legal fees 
to the bank if the transaction ultimately was not executed, if we didn't fulfill our commitment. Whereas with a typical public offering, if it, the deal doesn't go through, we don't pay anything other than potentially um, for trading agencies. So there's a little bit of risk, but, uh, but in substance, we don't see this as a more risky transaction than a typical public offering. So we are recommending uh, a private placement and um, using Compass Mortgage as the investor or selecting Compass Mortgage. Um, they meet what's, what's called the Qualified Institutional Buyer Criteria, and they were selected through a competitive process. Uh, we sent out a request for bid to 13 institutions, and only two were received. Just because of the nature of this, of this, what they call the credit, waterfront debt is unusual, so we were actually surprised and pleased that we got actually two proposals. Um, and Compass Mortgage offered the lowest overall cost, which we'll see a little bit later what that means. Um, and what's interesting is that the, the interest rates that, we, that they proposed are actually lower than what we would have expected if we did a public offering. And as I said at the front, front end, we typically would expect a higher interest rate, but there is value to that because of the reduced amount of staff time. But in this case, not only are we saving staff time, but we're actually getting lower costs um, than a typically, typical public offering. So it's a win-win for us. So in a sense, how does it change the picture? It's the same picture we looked at before, except that the bottom right you'll see instead of an, the investors, we replace that with one investor, and that's Compass Mortgage. But everything else stays exactly the same. So this is a comparison of the cost savings of, from a, a public offering versus going with the private placement using Compass Mortgage based on their proposal. So transaction costs, you can see we're going to be saving about uh, $45,000 from our consultants between our financial advisors and our bond council. We won't have to pay fifteen to eighteen thousand dollars to a rating agency, which would be required. Uh, the legal fees, um, fifteen thousand um, dollars, and actually that's a mistake that we wouldn't have anything in their public offering, but we would we would would have those or do have those with the uh, private placement with Compass Mortgage. The interest rates are all in as it's termed, four point oh eight on that we would expect to get in this market on our public offering. You can see it's lower than that um, proposed by uh, Compass Mortgage. The nominal savings, meaning what are the total dollars we would save over the, over the term of the, of the new debt? Under the public offering, we would expect about $990,000 in savings, but with their proposal, uh, we're going to look at almost a little over $1.1 million, so it's really a good deal for us. On a net present value basis, which means if you just say, kind of put it into today's dollars, the, that savings is $800,000 versus $988,000. And those are the percentages, 6.3 versus 7.8. And typically, when you look at whether you, it makes sense for us to pursue a rate refinancing, you're looking at a minimum of 3%. So this is well above the minimum we would look in terms of savings to make it worthwhile. And then lastly, the annual savings we could expect uh, on, under both scenarios. You can see far right, we're going to expect $170,000 in the first year, and then on an ongoing basis for the remaining 13 or 14 years, $68,000 per year. So certainly worth doing. Um, and certainly the Compass Mortgage proposal is, um, is a very attractive proposal to us relative to a, what we would get from a public offering. So before I go on to next steps, any questions on this proposal or the recommendation to go with a private placement? No. Okay. So our next steps, as I kind of mentioned, on December 10th, we will be um, to the full council, and we'll present the summarized version of this, of this report but we'll also be asking for, have some recommendations. One, we would be um, doing a first reading of the city ordinance, which authorizes the installment sale agreement and trust agreement. So that's the first reading. The following week would be a second reading. Um, we would be adopting a resolution by the authority. So the actual Santa Barbara Financing Authority would be authorizing, through a resolution, the execution of an installment sale agreement, a trust agreement, and the issuance of, of bonds. And then, as I mentioned, one week later, adoption of the ordinance, and then that ordinance would take effect on January 17th, 2014. And then shortly thereafter, the actual deal will, will close. We'll execute that transaction somewhere about a week or so later. So that's, that's all I have. Okay. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Questions from committee members? Mr. White? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I one question that you had asked, and um, I'm recalling, that was it the the West Marine facility and the Harbor Patrol headquarters, was that the, the big project that, that came out of this financing? Is that? Uh, 
Mr. Chair, Committee Member White, Scott Reedman, Waterfront Director. Um, this does not have to do with uh, West Marine. Um, just prior to 1984. Yeah, no, this we that building was financed through Waterfront Department Reserves and a loan from the General Fund of $1.7 okay. okay. So that was not included okay. in this. Prior to 1984, we got construction loans from the Department of Boating and Waterways, primarily for marina construction. The most obvious one was the complete replacement and reconfiguration of Marina One in 1977. And in 1984, we went away from that model of borrowing money from the state, and we went to this model of the bond issues. So we've had several since 1984. Um, and as you'll recall, in 1983, we had tremendous storms hit the harbor and cause a lot of damage. So the 1984 um, COP issue uh, paid off all the California Department of Boating and Waterways loans and brought out new money to do um, repairs to the marina, San sandbar breakwater extension, extensive repairs to um, the marina's wave run-up wall that you may notice between the Yacht Club and the West Marine Building and the par main, Harbor Main parking lot, um, ripped up asphalt, everything from the 83 storms. It was refinanced several times uh, since then, and the new uh, in 1992 there was another um, issuance, and three million was of new money was pulled out. When? Uh, 1992. I'm sorry, okay. if I said the wrong date. And that money was spent um, primarily on the Marina One and Four expansion. As you'll recall, we added about 70 new slips, had to dredge that area in the old mooring area, and also the reconfigure of the reconfiguration of the harbor way entrance and the ha main harbor parking lot moved the bike path and reconfigured all the the way that parking lot flowed so that was the new money and then the 2002 issuance was simply no new money was drawn out that was just simply getting a better interest rate as is what we're looking at today is simply no new money coming out refinancing the existing debt and it's also not extending it out another 30 years or 26 so I think the case was before it's still staying with the termination date of 2028 so we're not extending it out any longer than their existing 2002 issuance so that was one of the options could have been to extend the date and lower the payments and cho we, we chose not to do that yep. Mr. White, uh, typically we, we, we don't do that as a matter of practice. We don't look to extend debt just because even though you might generate some savings, but you're long term, you're just you're just sort of deferring or delaying the inevitable payoff of that debt. So our, our practice has been that we never look to extend beyond the original term whenever we refinance debt. So we keep the same um, final date, in this case, 2028. I know that's question, that question has come up in the past, but that's just been our practice. We, okay. we think it's good, makes good financial sense to so just keep the same termina termination date. Okay. And, uh, one of the things that, that in the staff report, and I'd appreciate it in the future, if we get a little bit of the pricey of the finances themselves, we have, there's no information about how much money was borrowed, et cetera, in the staff report. So that would be helpful for future okay. staff reports. And then so there, but, but there must have been a fairly, or some pay down between 2002 and present on that what what numbers were we started with and where are we now the 14 million is is the number now yeah and, and just and I'll let Scott answer this it's part of that but the reason we didn't put a specific dollar amount other than just in our example 14 is we don't know what that dollar amount is yet that'll be sort of finalized um, in the next several weeks once we kind of get firm on the, on the actual numbers and interest rates so that number is yet to be determined okay well and I'd appreciate seeing what that pay down was would be sure one piece I'd, maybe Scott knows that. Off. The 2002 certificates were 19 million, so just over 19 down million. So five in the, okay. in the 11 years. Approximately so, yes. Right. Okay. Thank you. Um, I guess and then just as a, the sure. one comment would be, uh, I'm, uh, I hate to see so much, so many complicated gymnastics required in order to make a common sense move. That's just uh, too bad, but that's what we got to do. Certainly, I appreciate that we're refinancing and, and lowering our interest rate costs. Um, I don't feel as badly about extending uh, uh, dates as, as the city policy. Uh, as long as the interest rates are low, that's kind of the, the and the cash flow works. Those are things that, that work for me. Uh, but I, I appreciate uh, the position and certainly can live with it. And it's a, very good project. Ms. Mario, any questions?
So I assume our action here is to recommend adoption of this by the by the full council, or is this just informational? Yeah, just informational, okay. and, and then you'll be better prepared when, when we come to council on the 10th. Okay. Well, if there are no further questions, meeting adjourned. All right, thank you. Thank you very much.